Hello, everyone. We are so excited that you joined us today for what promises to be another extraordinary conversation here in the College of Arts and Sciences. And I am privileged to be able to moderate the conversation we're going to have and your questions most importantly. So I'm gonna welcome our guests uh, first, we'll do them alphabetically. So I'm gonna welcome Spencer Hunt, who is the uh, Director of Student Media here at The Ohio State University and uh, teaches many classes in our journalism program. And then our guest of honor today is Phil Mattingly, who is the Senior White House Correspondent. Um, that's the title that he holds, but I know in his heart, he's a Buckeye and that is the most important title that he holds. Um, and so we are, very excited. I know I speak for all three of us to be here to talk with you about a topic that is near and dear to our hearts. Uh, the idea of journalism and its place as the fourth estate in, in, in our American system of democracy. And we want to hear from you. So please uh, give us your questions, upvote the questions that you find most interesting. Let us um, you know, really dig into a topic that, that is most relevant to you and most important to you. So welcome, Phil, back to Ohio State. We are so excited that you could be here with us. Uh, where are you? Tell us where you're coming from. Telling, coming in from today. Yeah, uh, go ahead and pre-apologize for the stellar backdrop that I currently have. It is a Marriott hotel of which brand I'm not totally sure because uh, I'm pretty much just in it for the Marriott points. But I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in advance of uh, President Biden is coming here tomorrow to roll out his the next major agenda item uh, <clears throat> legislatively in, in his economic portfolio. So uh, I drove in here uh, from DC about 30 minutes ago and spend the night here and then get to work tomorrow when the president comes to town. Can you kind of walk us through what your your job entails? Is this kind of the way that you spend most of your days, or how how does your job sort of navigate uh, within the White House's schedule? Yeah, look, it's this is the second time I've covered the White House. I covered uh, two years, about a year and a half of President Obama uh, when I was with Bloomberg uh, prior to CNN. Uh, it's obviously very different because it's we're in the middle of a pandemic and, and things are uh, the travel is very different. There's certainly less travel. Uh, there hasn't been any foreign travel yet. Usually by about now, the president has, has uh, tried to either go to Canada or Mexico uh, or both. What the president has been doing is some domestic travel, particularly to sell the, the coronavirus relief law that uh, he signed a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so last week I was in Columbus, actually on campus, which was like the greatest feeling in the world because because of the pandemic, my uh, annual sojourn to a football game was canceled this past year. Um, but uh, the day to day, you know, I'm coming, I came to the White House on inauguration day after years of covering Capitol Hill. And it's interesting. It's obviously significantly different than the last administration. Um, I do both TV, uh, but also digital as well. So print. So we're writing a lot of stories and then we're kind of building our entire day up to kind of our shows, our, our kind of premiere shows uh, started, which start at 4 p.m. and kind of go all the way uh, to midnight. And so writing a TV piece every single day from the White House about what the White House is up to while also kind of doing my own reporting, trying to write digital stories, break news as well. Um, and then every day at 1230, the White House press secretary gives a briefing. Um, and I'm usually sitting on that, uh, sitting in on that so with a little bit uh, roundabout because of COVID protocols in terms of if you're there every day, um, but I'm usually there three or four days a week. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I think it's the, the, the rhythm of things, while it's different because of the pandemic, it is very similar to not the previous administration, but the administration prior. And I think there's a, there's a rhythm in covering the White House, and that didn't necessarily exist the last four years, <laughs> which, which we can certainly talk about. But, but I think this administration is very similar to past both Republicans and Democrats in terms of how they do things in the schedule and, and kind of the churn of the day to day. Absolutely. I know that, that Spencer and I would both love to lay claim to you as a journalism major, but of course that is not the path that you took to Ohio State. Can you, you know, walk our, our, our guests through what you, uh, how you got through, through Ohio State, how you got to journalism, kind of what your path was? Yeah, if nothing else, it underscores that there's no one clear path into the industry to some degree. You know, my colleagues, a number of them majored in any, in any number of things. We've got folks who went to law school, folks folks who were pre-med. I was an English major. Um, I knew I wanted to, to be a reporter, to be a journalist. Um, when I came to Ohio State, I was, I was on the baseball team. And we weren't allowed to do extracurriculars and to kind of pursue the, the journalism path. There obviously needed to be lantern experience. Um, and so I chose English because I, I love to write and wanted to work on, on that craft as well and figured that was the kind of the second best option that I had. Um, and then when it became very clear uh, that baseball, particularly professional baseball, but largely college baseball as well, was not going to be uh, a pathway of success of mine when I looked at all of my teammates who were much better than I was uh, when I concluded my career at Ohio State. Um, I, I called a, a 
a woman who went to my high school, who's a very prominent columnist, her name's Christine Brennan, uh, who works over at the USA Today and said, you know, I wanna be a journalist, give me a job. And she said, absolutely not, because you actually need to do stuff to get a job. Um, and so she I was very blunt. Uh, she said, you need clips to get a job in journalism, call the Lantern and tell them you wanna work. And God bless the Lantern, because I called the Lantern and I said, I wanna write, I have no, no experience and no idea what to do. Um, can, I, can I work for you? And a week later, they had me go cover a speech. Uh, I ended up covering the men's hockey team um, for a season and wrote really, really bad sports columns uh, that I've already been pleading with Spencer to take offline. <laughs> um, and then, you know, the, the, that, so that was kind of Ohio State for me, you know, wonderful experience, but also uh, a little bit disjointed because of the, the athletic career. Um, and then, so I, I realized that to get a job, I needed to go to grad school um, to, to kind of have some opportunities. So I went to Boston University for grad school and uh, the summer, it was a three semester program, the summer in between um, my, my first year and my last semester, uh, I basically spent the last two months prior to that summer uh, sending letters to over a hundred newspapers around the country and just begging for an internship. And every single one of them said no uh, or didn't respond at all until two weeks before the summer, uh, Jim Crummel uh, over at the Lima News sent me an email and said, we can't pay anything. We don't know how you're gonna get here or where you're gonna live, but if you can get here and find a place to live, we'll let you work here unpaid for the entire summer. And so I packed up a U-Haul, drove to Lima, Ohio, rented a place, uh, worked all summer for the Lima News. And it was the best experience I ever had. Got a ton of clips, got a ton of experience. Um, and then my last semester at BU was down in Washington. They have a Washington DC program. And so came down, fell in love with the city, fell in love with the access in terms of, you know, covering lawmakers, covering people in power, covering policy, um, and basically begged every single Capitol Hill publication, kind of very small niche publications um, for a job. And, and one of them had an opening covering a beat that I was completely incapable of covering, banking and financial services. Um, I think I failed my loan econ class at Ohio State. Um, and it made very clear, like I got into journalism because there was no math, um, but, uh, uh, but, you know, as is kind of, yeah, right. It's kind of been the case throughout my career. I, I kind of lucked into the biggest story in the world. A couple of months later, Bear Stearns collapsed. Uh, it was the start of the 2008 financial crisis and covering Congress and covering banking and finance on Capitol Hill, no matter the size of your publication, uh, when the entire global economy was resting on the shoulders of lawmakers, I was in a pretty good place for that. Um, and so did uh, finance stuff after the financial crisis, moved over to Bloomberg News to continue to cover finance. Um, at a bigger publication. And um, while I was there, didn't want to be pigeonholed purely as a business reporter. And so broke out a little bit to cover the White House there. And Bloomberg News also uh, has a television uh, component of it called Bloomberg TV. And they asked if I'd uh, be willing to do television. And I wasn't super interested in it. It wasn't something I ever wanted to do. I always wanted to, my goal was to write for the Wall Street Journal. Um, but I decided to give it a shot so long as I could keep writing. And um, it, it ended up working out okay. And about a year, year and a half later, CNN called. Uh, and asked if I'd come on board. And so I, I went to CNN and ended up hopping right into a pretty consequential campaign. The 2016 campaign um, was on the road covering Republican candidates for roughly 23, 24 days a month um, for the entirety of 2016. Um, and then so covered then candidate Trump uh, during the general election. Uh, and then once uh, President Trump won, I stayed, uh, I, I was up in New York and did his transition and then came back uh, to DC and, and went to Capitol Hill, which is kind of where I was, it's kind of my home um, and covered Congress uh, for the, the entirety of the Trump administration. And then on January 20th of this year, uh, I moved over to the White House to cover the, the Biden administration. And here we are. Here we are. You know, it's interesting to hear how your path took you from, you know, a small paper like Lima, and then you mentioned approaching smaller publications in DC. A lot of those smaller publications don't exist anymore, or, you know, we've really contracted news. And I'm curious, from your perspective, how is that affecting us and our ability to kind of understand the, ne the news that we need to be informed? It's a nightmare. Um, it's a, you know, I could see it when I, was, when I was in Lima, and this was 2006, 2007, I guess, summer 2007. Um, you know, the number of reporters uh, was dwindling at the publication, and that this wasn't exclusive to, to the Lima News, this is across the board. And that meant that the reporters, uh, fewer reporters were responsible for as much or more work because of obviously the, the online component of things. 
And that takes away from your ability to really work a beat. It takes away from your ability to keep government officials count accountable, whether it's the city council, whether it's a school board, whether it's the United States Congress. Um, and, and you know, to lose that on the local level, all that does is open up doors for people to be corrupt, for people to make side deals, for people to do the types of things that, that journalists, um, you know, I think pride ourselves in trying to root out. You know, I think part of what, you know, maybe some of the the mission that, that gets glossed over is when you're thinking about cable news and, and panels and people yelling at one another is um, our, our job is to discover the truth, not because it makes us feel good or because it gets Twitter followers, but because that's what leads to good governance. That's what holds people accountable. Uh, and that that is true on the absolute local level as it is sitting in the White House briefing room. And so it's not just, you know, local newspapers, but also in DC, you know, where obviously I've been for the last uh, 12 years, 13 years, you know, there's no local correspondence uh, covering the delegations anymore. There's maybe two or three. Uh, when I started, every big state had people in town. Um, and those those reporters covered the lawmakers better than we ever could, because uh, we were always focused on leadership or we were focused on whatever the big picture policy issue was of the day or the politics of the issue. And the number of things I would learn, you know, from the Columbus Dispatch team that was in Washington, D.C., uh, about what the Ohio delegation was doing. Um, it also erodes trust with members. The members trust, members of Congress trust their local reporters, um, very much so, because they know that, that those their voters are reading that every single day. And so to lose that, both on the micro level in whatever small town or city you're talking about, but also on the macro level, um, having those types of reporters in Washington has been a, a tremendous loss. Um, and I would say not just because I like those colleagues and I, I thought very highly of their abilities, but also in terms of people actually knowing what's going on on a daily basis. Absolutely. You know, Spencer, I, I find it interesting um, to hear what Phil's saying and to think about how long, you know, the lantern has held its place in terms of uh, where people get their news, where there's trust, where there's respect. You know, even Phil's talking about taking clips out of the lantern and being able to parlay that into an amazing career. How do you think the changes to journalism have affected um, people's perceptions of the lantern, the lantern's perceptions of itself? Um, well, this year especially, right? There are presence. Uh, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it would be like presence in news racks, right? We measure it now in terms of views online. And, uh, and so when I talk to the students about, you know, I still, I will still use the word clips, but we're talking about really sending links to employers to show what we do. The, the dynamic is still very much the same. I mean, you know, uh, he, he, we're, we're talking about, you still have to show people what you can do and what you can do is what you've had published. And so um, the collaborative uh, and that supportive kind of environment that you're able to find, right? That's still here. It's just how we deliver it. And I think it's also uh, harder to cut through the noise that's out there in terms of how people get their information. And so where the lantern figures within um, the menu of options that everybody has to get information, uh, we have to try to find ways to position ourselves to reach people in, in you know, our audience in, in, with stories that only the lantern can deliver. And so it changes your approach a lot because you have to invite people to see the news these days. You don't have captive audiences anymore with people who are waiting to find out things. We have to respond a lot faster. So a lot of the, the challenges that our students face um, are very much in line with the challenges that um, professional news organizations are facing across the board. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and you know, we, we have a lot of questions that have come in and we definitely wanna to get to all of your questions. I have some that came in early that I wanna make sure to, um, to tackle. And then I see you guys are submitting and, and please keep them coming. Um, but we have this kind of crisis of confidence and the idea that we can't trust anyone, but we used to be able to trust journalists. And now we have this fear that everybody has an agenda. And we've even experienced that at The Lantern this year, this idea that we have an agenda. And Phil, you work for you know, CNN, which you know, people have branded as a liberal leaning news entity where you have Fox as a conservative leaning news entity, et cetera. How do we gain the level of trust that we need for people to believe that truth is truth? Yeah, look, it's one of the, the questions of our time right now, right? Obviously, there's there's a thousand business questions we need to figure out answers to, and those actually, co I think they kind of converge. All of the different issues we're facing converge uh, to create the moment that that we're currently in. Look, I think one of the one of the things that I've always been struck by is 
you know, I am all for people accessing information from wherever they want to access information. Where I think we have fallen short as an industry is, and not everybody, but in terms of education about what we actually do and who we actually are. You know, I am not uh, our primetime opinion hosts. Um, I'm not an editorial columnist. I'm a reporter. And I think a lot of times, uh, you know, <clears throat> in large part because of the environment that we were living in over the course of the last five or six years, because I work for CNN, I am the equivalent of one of our opinion hosts. Or because I work for CNN, um, I must be a, a liberal shill or, or whatever the terminology is. And I don't, I am not one who blames people necessarily for feeling that way. I, I feel like it's incumbent upon me to, to prove to them or to explain to them why I'm not that. Um, and, and I think that's, that's industry wide. You know, people don't know the difference between uh, normal human beings, don't know the difference necessarily between the, the editorial page of the New York Times and the day-to-day the -day beat reporters of the New York Times. And sometimes they all get uh, pushed together. And, and so I, I don't take the view that like I should be, or a major news organization should be the arbiter of what is news and what is real and all of those types of things. But I do think people need to understand that part of the reason why we've played that role over the course of history is because of the safeguards that we have in place. Um, and are they perfect? No. Have we failed them? Many times. But there are repercussions when we fail. We have to issue corrections. Those corrections are usually bold and up top in my stories um, <clears throat> when they happen. If we lie, if we uh, print falsehoods, any of those types of things, there are major repercussions inside my organization uh, for that, for any reporter who, who plagiarizes or, or makes, makes things up. Um, that is not the case with a lot of the other entities that have burgeoned over the course of the last several years. The, those safeguards are not in place. And I'm not saying we're perfect. And again, I don't believe we should be the arbiter of what is or isn't uh, news in this world. People should be able to get their information from a number of different places. But I think part of the issue that we run into is we work under this assumption that people must know what we do. And people must understand what the safeguards are that are in place or what the difference is between opinion uh, and a beat reporter. And we haven't done the best job of explaining that. I feel like we got really behind the ball on it and we've been trying to catch up ever since. Um, and so I think I, I have a difficult, uh, it, it's a difficult thing that we're all dealing with right now um, because there's also, there's perverse incentives to some degree, right? You move over into that opinion category, you move over into that person who's shouting on a panel and all of a sudden your Twitter followers skyrocket and maybe you get a book deal and all these types of things too. And, and so you've got all of these things kind of pinging off one another that create the job of the, the just straight news reporter who's just trying to tell you what they're seeing, reporting and hearing, um, it, it makes the job a little bit more difficult. One, one thing I would say is, you know, I don't, I don't chafe when people call me a liberal or say I'm biased or say X, Y, Z. I, I ask why. I want to know. I learn from people. And there have been, there's been more than one occasion, and I try not to read my Twitter mentions all that much, <laughs> um, but where I'll, I will phrase something or I will frame something in a way and someone will point out like, hey, the way you did that made it sound like you were totally on the side of one, one entity or another. And I, that's, I'm all for that. I want to hear that. I might disagree with it, or I might think they're wrong, or I might not think it's in good faith. But there are times where I sit there and I go, you know what, they're right. And like, I need to change how I'm approaching this, or how I'm explaining this, or how I'm presenting this, um, to try and avoid the very issues that, that I think have complicated how we do our jobs on a daily basis. I think this is a perfect segue to the two most recent administrations that we have had. And, and I'd, I'd like to go back to actually three of them. So if we think across the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and now Biden, I'm sure that there are people who are saying, you know, that, that the Trump administration was incredibly detrimental to journalism and, you know, enemy of the people and all that, and how much better it is under Biden. And then there'll be people who say that the media is giving Biden a pass. And you know, the, the example most recently, is, as ridiculous as may be, of him falling up the stairs, that that clip did not go viral as it would have if it had been Trump and that it's, you know, they're cutting him all kinds of slack because he's not Trump. How do we, well, can you tell us from the inside what it's like having covered those three administrations, how they're similar, how they're different? And I, and I know, and, and we've talked about this before, administrations we may think did things really well, in truth, from a journalistic standpoint, didn't do things necessarily as well as we thought they did. So how, how can you help us kind of understand what it was like to cover those three administrations? Yeah, look, obviously we'd never seen or dealt with anything that like we dealt with over the course of the last four years. And I don't think even a, a, a big time Trump supporter or somebody in the Trump press team would, would acknowledge that. It was a very different atmosphere. Obviously it was a much more volatile public atmosphere. And in terms of the types of criticisms that were thrown our way and the president's ability to rally people 
um, through uh, borderline hate at times was something that we'd never experienced before. But I, I think it's important to point out, and I'm not trying to compare things as apples to apples to apples over the course of the last three administrations. I covered the Bush administration as well in, in its waning years. And I, I've never dealt with more professional communications people um, who were better at their jobs, more knowledgeable than I did in those final, final year, year and a half of the Bush administration. Um, you know, with the Obama administration, if you look at some of the things they did, particularly through the Justice Department and some of the leak investigations, uh, a lot of them were continuations, but, but the, the way they operated, particularly in the early half of the administration, uh, was, was a level of aggressiveness we've never seen before in terms of going after journalists. And they, they to their credit, the Justice Department changed their rules and, and kind of revamped uh, how they did things, but they only did that because we found out what they were doing and made a big public issue of it. Uh, I always joke, I, I've, I received more, I've told you guys this, I received more profanity laden emails or screaming phone calls from Obama administration officials than I ever did from Trump folks. <laughs> but that, like, I don't, I don't take that personally. That's a tension that always exists and, and that's fine. People handle things in different ways, but I, I don't want everybody to think it was all roses and butterflies uh, prior to the Trump administration. Now the Trump administration obviously was very different and it was very different for, for one reason. And that was the individual in the Oval Office. Um, you know, and it, some of his top advisors were kind of the same way. I, I think the biggest difference between the Obama administration and the Trump administration that I saw is just the willingness to just flat out lie uh, on a regular basis. And that's from the president, but also his team. Uh, you know, we were used to, you know, if, if the Obama folks didn't, didn't want to tell you something, they just wouldn't tell you. They wouldn't lie to your face. Or, you know, the Trump folks would often play a game where they would lie to you just to see if you would put it out. And they, they found that to be kind of a sport of like, isn't that funny? We just had them put out something that was completely inaccurate just because we felt like doing it. Um, obviously the public pressure and, and what you saw publicly from the president was, it speaks for itself. Um, Biden administration, look, the, you know, I think there's a, we have early frustrations with them in terms of access, particularly to border facilities. Today was the first day they opened up a CBP facility uh, for reporters to actually see it. Um, that's been something we've been asking for, not just behind the scenes. We've been, I've been one of many reporters who's asked during the White House press briefings, like we need access to this. We need to show people what's happening here. Um, we understand that this is a big issue you guys are dealing with, but people need to see what's happening. Um, slowly but surely they're coming along on that. And I think we talked about this last week, you know, their, their willingness to allow local media into the events like they did in Columbus or like they're gonna do in Pittsburgh. I understand they're dealing with, with a pandemic and, and I don't envy, the advanced team trying to figure that all out. But you know, local reporters are as important, I would argue more important uh, to those types of visits than, than I am, or than certainly the national media is. And so you know, they've heard those concerns. Those concerns are, are relayed by the White House Correspondents Association. Um, we've had pledges that they will be addressed. Uh, but you know, it's a long-winded way of saying nobody's perfect. There's no great administration. Obviously, the last four years weren't ideal for journalism writ large. Um, in large part because of the, what people's perceptions were based on what you saw uh, from the Oval Office. But that, that tension always exists and, and we're always gonna be getting in fights with administrations uh, over access and, and making sure people are telling the truth and holding people to account. You know, Spencer, I don't, I, I, it, it's so interesting. I mean, at, at the highest level and at our level, we're dealing with a lot of the similar issues. I mean, certainly we were, um, the lantern was prevented as, as Phil noted from being able to get into the administration, but you know, we have issues uh, with public records and with, you know, getting access to things locally. How do you prepare students recognizing that, you know, in order to be the watchdog that we need people to be, they're maybe gonna have to fight a bit harder than, than they expected to or than generations before them had to. Yeah, I was just listening to what Phil was saying, um, and I think, you know, over like say the past 20 years, there's been a steady ratcheting down on all levels of access. My main concern as a reporter was like, you know, getting a hold of data or, or records. And, you know, when I started uh, here in Ohio, I, would, I could call somebody in the governor's office and say, I need this information. And there was an understanding that I should have that because it was public record. And maybe even that day, I would get it. That is not the case at all. And so when we're talking to students about what it is that um, they need to expect, well, you know, um, the, the system that's in place is going to delay the delivery of information records wise uh, for at least, you know, at least a couple of weeks, often more than a month. And we've had, you know, situations where a student graduated uh, and got the information that she was looking for three days before. So 
Um, and the same things are happening, you know, with access for interviews. Um, we were just talking about the president's visit and, you know, a presidential visit for a, a, a student journalist is an excellent experience because you get to see all of these things for the first time. Um, so the, the thing that's most concerning is that these are all government officials. They're answerable to the public. And so we're the most forward facing branch of that public. And if, if reporters and journalists who were paid to do this as their job to talk to people on, you know, uh, on the public's behalf can't get this access, what's it gonna be like for um, average citizens? And then, you know, for student journalists, you know, uh, the, they're working really hard and they're learning this craft and that's even more difficult for them. And so when I'm talking to them, it's like, be prepared and I'm, uh, to, to deal with these kinds of delays, but then also look at this as an example for how it's going to be when you do graduate and get that job. And so uh, we try to turn everything into a learning experience. I just wish it was a different kind of experience. And I, I skipped over part of this question. So I wanna let you know, Sandy uh, Hermanoff noted Phil, that you are the smartest and handsomest on-air personality at CNN. So when she was curious, she, she noticed that people are looking 10 years younger since Biden was elected. Do you feel like you're here? <laughs> yeah, look, I, 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 I don't even think my wife would agree with the, the top line assessment, um, but, but I appreciate it very much. Um, yeah, look, I don't, I don't mean this as a it's, I, I want to be make very clear that like we have issues covering the Biden administration as we did with the Trump administration and we're still working through a lot of things and nothing is easy and nothing's co like 100% copacetic. Uh, we have weekends now and that is that is a huge difference. Um, you know, I've got three kids under six, uh, you know, having being able to, to kind of unplug for a couple of days a week. Uh, has had a demonstrably positive impact on my life and my family's life. And I think we're all kind of in the same boat on that. Also, you know, one of the strangest things for covering the last four years, and obviously I was on the Hill and not the White House, but, you know, the White House, again, works on a very normal rhythm of, you know, you know not to expect any news until, uh, you know, the pool shows up at the White House, you know, the, the small group of reporters, it's always around the president when he's moving, um, you know, at eight or nine in the morning. And the White House usually tells you that they say there's a lid and there's not going to be any news after they issue a lid. And there was no lid in the Trump administration. You know, the lid was whenever the president decided to stop tweeting or whenever he decided to wake up and start tweeting. And so that kind of, you know, we had to schedule around 6 a.m. tweets or 10 p.m. tweets. Uh, and so the, the inability to ever unplug, and we're obviously moving in a 24-7 news cycle anyway, uh, and that the speed just never seems to slow down. It only seems to accelerate. Um, that has changed, and, and that has been nice. Quality of life, which I don't think any of us had, uh, could lay claim to over the course of the last four or five years. Uh, has improved, not because of the policies of the individual in office, but because the individual in office isn't using 280 characters on a regular basis. <laughs> well, what do you think the ramifications are, you know, looking beyond the personality of, of President Trump, but the idea that a president could speak directly to the people? And, you know, we actually, in, in our media law class, we do a debate on whether or not that was good for democracy or not. And, and they actually make a really good argument on both sides. So I'm curious from both of you, you know, we, we've had such a gatekeeper function in the past where journalists were responsible for letting the public know what their, how the government was doing the people's business. But now the government can let the people know themselves and they can certainly filter it any way that they wish. Some people said it's good for democracy. Some people say it's bad. How would you guys answer that? Maybe Spencer, you could start. Well, you get to assess the, I mean, I always like to the Colbert report, the truthiness of <laughs> what comes out. And, and that's a vital function. I mean, government has always wanted to present its case. The fact that if you have more channels to do so and, and, a, and a access to a larger audience doesn't really change the nature of what it is that we do. And we have access to those same channels. And so when, um, uh, I hate the word spin, but the, the image that you present, if it is not accurate, it's our job to point out how and why. If people don't like that, well, here are the facts. Um, you know, to get to a couple other things we we're talking about, was when people are talking about, uh, you know, how they perceive the media, so there's a liberal bias, there's always been kind of a liberal bias image to the media. But you know, I think 
we used to say like the, the facts of the story, the story speaks for itself. We can't really do that. We have to engage with people you know, on all levels to be as transparent and, and as honest as possible. And I think that's important for our students to be learning as well. We put the story out, but then we also communicate with people who expect responses about why and what and, and when we get it and those kinds of things. Yeah, I, look, I, it, I feel like it's probably, it's happened since the beginning of time where every government official wants to get their, their message out uh, unfiltered by us without our, our fact checking or any of that type of stuff attributed to it. And I understand why um, I don't knock them for doing it. The one, the one thing I will say, you know, I, I've made this point much to the frustration of my colleagues many times, you know, we've never known more about what it, the individual in the Oval Office was thinking at all times than we did with President Trump. Like that was, that, that was amazing, you know, and I, whether it was good or bad, I'm not gonna render judgment on, but you knew what he was thinking literally always. And like, that, that's crazy. You never have that kind of insight or that kind of window into the Oval Office. And to be frank, it was helpful from a coverage perspective because you knew where his head was on any given moment on any given issue. Um, and that, particularly given I wasn't covering the White House, I was covering Capitol Hill, uh, that was remarkably helpful in my reporting and could, was also remarkably useful in terms of digging out things that were going on. He would hint at so many things that were happening behind the scenes on Twitter just because he would get mad. Uh, and you could use that as a tool and go to your sources and say like, I, I think I'm, I, I'm getting the sense that he's talking about X, Y, or Z. Was there a meeting? Was there something that happened here that's firing him up? And nine times out of 10, the answer was yes. Um, you know, the flip side of that is, you know, we've never been confronted to, at least to the scale uh, with just pure falsehoods. And I think we, as a, as a news business, um, have really struggled in terms of how to deal with it. And, you know, we all have, we have fact checkers and we have, you know, wonderful teams of people that, that did a great job trying to hold people to account or try and say, all right, this is your view of things. This is your message. Here's the reality of what's going on. Uh, but when that message is unfiltered and it's reaching, you know, 100, 200 million people via social media, uh, I think there, there have been a lot of long meetings and no real great answers as to what, what's our role here? How are we supposed to try and make sure that those people see uh, what's happening and what's true? I, I'm totally fine with the administration trying to get their, their message out any way that they want to. Um, I just want them to understand that, that we have a role too. And that, that, that's a tension that, that always exists and that's totally fine. Um, one final thing I would say on this, and this kind of gets to, to what Spencer was saying about you know, how every, everything's become more difficult, everything's more complicated. It feels like you're just running into brick walls on a regular basis when it comes to getting information. I tell this anytime I talk to, to and this goes to younger reporters, but also younger communicators, you know, have the relationship. The best communications folks I've ever dealt with in my entire life are, one, they're honest with me, uh, but two, they know that I'm not going to burn them, that they can pick up the phone and say, look, here's what's really happening. I can't say this out loud, but let me give you some context as to what's happening right now. And that's them doing their jobs. They're trying to shape my stories. They're trying to kind of figure out which way I'm going on things. Uh, but that establishes a trust. And it's also a trust that I'm not gonna call them five minutes before I'm gonna pop a story burning their boss and say, you've got five minutes to respond. I'm gonna give them time. I'm gonna let them know what I'm writing, um, all that type of stuff too. And I think one of the things of the myriad of issues that we've been dealing with over the course of the last several years is because of the speed of our news cycles, because of how we all operate, the number of relationships that exist between our two sides has dwindled. Uh, and it's, it's defined more by lack of trust than by trust. And I think that that's, that's problematic for both sides. That's not a me knocking comms people. That's a, you know, that's our side has a responsibility there too, um, to be forthright, to be upfront, to let people know what we're writing and why we're writing it. Um, and then to Spencer's point, once we write it, once we put it out there to be as transparent as possible about how we got to where we are uh, and be willing to defend ourselves and explain whether it's on social media or through, you know, sidebars or something like that, that like this is how we got to our information and this is why we're confident that what we're writing are the actual facts. Absolutely. Um, I, I did want to, we had a question um, about evidence of local media being excluded from the Biden event. And Linda, I just wanted to mention that there were restrictions on local media when uh, President Biden was at Ohio State. So the Lantern, for example, was not allowed to be in that space. Uh, the Columbus Dispatch was, I, a couple other newspapers. So there, it's, I'm not saying it's a blanket thing, but there, there's examples. Uh, and you know, it's a big deal for student journalists to be able to cover a president when he comes here. And it, this is the first time in my memory, well, when President Trump came, it was a different circumstance, but um, it's not really common, I think, to exclude student journalists from things. Um, 
So, um, you know, we, it's so interesting, and, and I mean, talking with you, Phil, it's, it's natural for us to, to be focusing on the federal level, but we lose track of like the state level and the county level and this, you know, the district, the, the, the community level. Um, nobody's covering that anymore. You know, we have so few reporters that are covering local government. You know, there's meetings going on every day that nobody's attending. We don't know how the government is doing the people's business because no one's there to report it. What's the effect of that? I mean, we, we seem to have, even our students, and I think Spencer would agree, they know a lot about what's going on nationally, but they know very little about what's going on locally. And I think that would be indicative of an entire population. How do we combat that? Uh, you know, find a business model that works on the local level. I, and I, you know, I'm not trying to be flip about that. Um, you know, there, there's some, whether it's through nonprofits, there, there's been so many different efforts to try and figure it out or whether it's, you know, Axios or Politico trying to do kind of state-based uh, reporting as, as well. Everybody knows it, everybody sees it. Um, you know, my, one of my favorite things to do every year is when the Pulitzers come out is look for the local, look at the local reporting. I know the na national folks, I have a pretty good idea of who's going to win on the national level. A lot of them are my friends. Um, but, uh, you know, you look at the local reporting and you see the, the type of stuff that they're uncovering, the corruption, uh, huge issues, it matters of life and death for the citizens of, you know, their county or their city or their town. Um, and you realize, you know, for every one of those that, was uncovered and that ended up winning this major award, you know, there's gotta be hundreds of similar types of situations happening around the country that no one's paying any attention to. And, you know, I've long felt that the pendulum right now, it leans far more towards what the federal government is doing on a, on a daily basis. You know, I, I don't remember, you know, I wasn't a huge news nerd when I was a kid, I was a history nerd, um, but, you know, I, I wasn't super focused on what Washington was doing every single day. I knew what Mayor Cardi Finkbeiner in Toledo, Ohio was doing on a pretty regular basis because the Toledo Blade was a ro robust newspaper back then. Um, and I'm, that's not, I'm not taking a shot at them now. I'm just saying that when I was, when I lived in Toledo, um, I, I feel like that's how it should be. You know, where I live, I want to know what's happening in, in my kind of neck of the woods, I, I don't really care necessarily what Washington is doing on a, on a daily basis. And, and I feel like to your point, Professor Kraft, you know, the reason why people care more about the federal level is because that's what they see. That's what's on cable news. That's what's on uh, the web on, on a regular basis. That's what's leading everything. And I just don't think, you know, on a day to day basis, what's having a bigger impact on your life? Uh, probably zoning issues or you know whether your school is opening or what your vaccination uh, schedule or eligibility is in your community like those are the things that matter on a day-to-day -day as a parent uh, or as somebody who lives uh, in a, a particular district and, and so you know I don't know I, I, I leave it to, to really smart people like you guys to, to figure out what the, what the business model I know <laughs> what the business model is I, I just I'm I'm not sure and I think this all it also goes to perverse incentives of what's you know Spencer you kind of hit on this you got to draw eyeballs what's drawing eyeballs what's what's getting clicks what's getting ad revenue what's you know all that type of stuff and then we move into the type of stuff that gets clicks and the type of stuff that, that draws attention isn't necessarily the stuff that that matters that should matter the most to most people um so it's kind of a circular way of getting, getting getting the vet like I don't I don't know the answer I, I don't know the answer and I, I think it's a it's a huge huge issue and I feel like to be honest the last four years have papered over to some degree um, because on the national level you know we had ratings that we could have never imagined uh, you know the New York Times had subscription and Washington Post and all these national news organizations uh, succeeded at a level that frankly their business model in the direction it's been headed uh, it was it was uh, an anomaly. It wasn't reality. And I think, you know, my concern now is that that was kind of an inflated bump that everybody was dealing with on the national level. And there are bigger issues we're going to be dealing with, not just on the local level, but across the board in journalism uh, as that dissipates over the course of the next year, two years, three years. Right. And then we have several questions that have come in. Um, someone uh, mentions about Robin Kemp of Clayton Georgia, County, Georgia, who... Um, was reporting, you know, independently and had a Kickstarter. We have, you know, people who are trying to cover news deserts, you know, hyper local entities that are opening up. Spencer, do you see, you know, in terms of, of how we're trying to develop the next generation of, of journalists, is there a space here for them to, um, to maybe fill in some of these spaces where news just is not being disseminated? We were just talking about this today um, in terms of how we prepare uh, in, in, in the Lantern class. Um, the disruption in terms of money is dramatically real and it accelerated during, during the pandemic. 
um, at the same time, there are probably more opportunities for students to find um, employment or opportunities as journalists now than there ever were before. The question is, what is the level of income that you can expect to get and what is the stability of these organizations? Um, a lot of the digital organizations are like one topic only, right? And, they're, and that's because your audience is a lot more marketable too. I always like to talk about 11 Warriors and, and where they are in terms of covering the Buckeyes. But we have uh, other digital organizations that are covering the state house, and um, I, I want to. I think it's called Ohio Capital Journal. This has kind of come on, and they're, they're totally just digitally focused. And so, but still, then the question is: Is that business model enough? The online business model enough to to actually support people? The students, I think, that are coming out now are what we need to do is position them with a, a number of digital skills that I never had to learn. I just, you know, how to how to how to report and write. But we need our students have to leave here not only knowing that, but uh, how to to take you know video and edit that, how to how to crunch data, um, how to be adept in social media, all of these kinds of skills that you need to you know, bring in to one person it used to be split out among all these different specialties and different media. Um, we, we're not operating in that environment anymore. So if you can, I think there is a real future for somebody that leaves uh, who's got experience in all of these different areas. You know, we have a question that's come in about um, honesty being lost in the news and you know, it's, it, I, I joke with my husband, my husband's a third grade teacher who teaches special needs kids and I was a journalist and I'm now an educator. Um, and, and I said, you know, we used to be really respected in society and now I think we're among the least respected, um, you know, uh, positions in, in our culture. And how do we get that back? I mean, if, if we don't, if, if, you know, the speed of, of news has compromised our integrity uh, in certainly very high profile examples. People don't feel they can trust news. There's a feeling that um, there's bias in the news and that you know people who are supporters of, of, of President Trump can't be served by the mainstream, what we've considered to be mainstream news. How do we get this back if we have this, this constant feeling of distrust among the entities that are supposed to be providing us with the most trustworthy service? Yeah, Spencer, uh, <laughs> maybe got a better answer than I me. That's some thoughts on that, but um, but go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Go ahead. I'll, oh I'll go well, ahead I, I think people's uh, people's uh, views on bias in the media is situational, and so generally, I believe you know if I'm if I'm an average news consumer, generally I believe that um, news is dishonest or focused or slanted in a way that's not akin to my interests, but when a story comes out that answers all the questions that I have in the moment that I need it and reveals something in a way that is done well and I have no questions about it, I value that. And, and so, you know, the, I think the goal for us is to continually be able to, to continually be able to deliver the news that people value outside of that environment, that general environment in which we think about the news. Because for most people, the news is, I care about this now, and so I'm gonna look at it on my phone, and when I see that, then I value it, right? But um, the more we're able to have that kind of experience repeat with people, then I think we get some of our audience back, some of our audience. It's still an issue where I think we have to uh, be able to reach more people in a way with more truthful information. And I think there's a lot more opportunities for people to get stuff that's not. And so, you know, for me, um, I've seen a lot of response from people uh, to stories that we break that are really factual and they have a lot of that. They find, they find a lot of value. In them. Um, but then uh, we go back to the mode where, okay, now I'm thinking about all the other things that are going on in my life and you know, then we're, you know, how do we kind of cut through that, that noise? Does that make sense? I think that's, that's probably where I want to be. Yeah. I yeah. No, yeah. No, I actually, I think that makes total sense. I, 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 I have spent a ton of time uh, and a lot of quiet moments trying to figure this all out for my, myself. And I, I think the, the conclusion I came to a couple of years ago um, was to handle it on the micro level. Like I'm not going to have the, I can't decide, you know, whether folks who just do takes with no reporting and yet get a ton of clicks and a ton of interest or folks who are on air uh, giving their opinion about things. 
you know, I can't dictate what they're doing or whether or not that, that, that that's successful uh, from a revenue standpoint or from an ad standpoint. What I can do and what I can control is how I operate. And, and my view of things, and I, I, try and I try and explain this, particularly to younger folks coming up, um, because I understand the poll, right? It's a lot easier to not have to do reporting and just to write a hot take of 350 words about whatever's going on. You're, you're probably gonna get more clicks than the deeply reported piece about things. Um, but, you know, is that the reporter you, you wanna be? And my view of it is every time somebody sees me on TV or every time somebody sees my byline, they come away from that story thinking like, hey, that guy's all right. You know, maybe he's, he's talking about something that I disagree with, but like he knows what he's talking about. He's done the work. He's clearly done the reporting and he understands the subject matter. Um, and, and I wanna bring that kind of depth to whatever I'm doing, even if it's just a 90 second live shot. And it also, it extends, you know, I, I had a moment, I don't know, it might've been 18 months into the Trump administration where I looked at my Twitter account and like it had just become so of the norm to just snark and, you know, comment on everything and all that type of stuff. And I had a Republican congressman pull me aside and he said, look, he's like, I know you, um, but not everybody does. And, and at some point there's going to be, he was talking about one of his colleagues is going to look at your Twitter account and that's all he's going to know of you, right? He's not going to have seen you report. He doesn't know you personally. He doesn't have a relationship with you. And all he sees you is snarking above a Trump tweet or snarking above some other tweet. And he's going to make up his mind about you right then and there. And that's not to say that I'm not sarcastic on Twitter every once in a while, or I don't, I don't have fun, um, but, you know, we all do. But it was a real moment of, you never know when someone's watching, you know, this is kind of the old sports adage. Um, and you never know when someone's gonna see something you say on TV or see a tweet of yours or see a short story of yours and have that be the sole basis for whether or not they believe you're telling the truth. And I try and keep that in mind with every story that I write and every time I'm on air, you know, it's very easy to get drawn in, particularly on live TV, into these conversations where you just kind of let it fly uh, and, and maybe you go a little bit further than you want to. Um, but instead, kind of take it through the, the approach of, you know, I want random person X in Toledo, Ohio, who's never seen CNN before and has no idea who I am to watch me on TV and say, OK, I, I, I feel like that guy, like he gave it to me straight. And maybe that affects 10 people over the course of a year, or maybe it affects 50. Um, but I feel like the more people approach it like that and keep in mind that people are watching your social media and they're watching you on TV and they're watching uh, what you're writing, uh, that maybe if more people took that approach, not that I have the answer, but if more people took that approach, it would go a long way to changing the dynamic that has really driven a lot of the distrust, which is, you know, I, I don't need to make fun of people on Twitter. I don't need to be snarky. I, I don't need to have my personal comment on every little thing that's happening uh, because that's not my job. You know, my job is to tell you about the infrastructure plan. You know, my job is to, to tell you about healthcare policy. Uh, I'm going to stick to my job and I'm probably going to tweet a lot about Ohio State football too, uh, but, uh, but mostly my job. <laughs> well, and I think that's incredible advice and I hope that the students that are with us are listening to that advice because, you know, we certainly, um, you know, mention to them, they'll never make a first impression again, right? Their social media will be their first impression. And I think it's a great segue into some questions that we've gotten specifically about, you know, preparing students. And so Sandy Hermanoff's asking what advice you'd give students who want to work in TV or newspapers. How could they best position themselves to follow in your footsteps? Learn a report. Uh, you know, one of the most fascinating and probably underappreciated elements of television, uh, of television news over the course of the last decade look around at the correspondents. They're all print people. You know, I came from print. Manu Raju came from print. Clayton, Caitlin Collins came from print. Sarah Murray came from print. Um, you know, we were reported, and I'm not knocking folks that were that are broadcast majors or went to, you know, Syracuse University to broadcast. Like your education is way better than mine and you know more about the technical side of TV and I have no doubt that everybody will be immensely successful. Uh, but the coin of the realm is breaking news. Uh, and not just breaking news that ends up being wrong or being the first one on Twitter, but like really breaking news uh, and having people who trust you, sources that will tell you things. You learn to report, they will find, there will be a place for you uh, in print or TV. And, you know, I, I, I think learning to write is obviously a huge component of that. Uh, but I know a lot of great reporters who aren't great writers. Uh, that's the beauty of editors. I, I, <laughs> I, I think we all fancy ourselves, you know, New Yorker profile writers to some degree. And my editors will tell you as they chop, you know, 1700 words off my next piece uh, that perhaps I think that of myself a little bit too much. Um, but if you can break news, there will be there will be a job for you. 
uh, and I, I, I can't stress, I can't stress that enough. And I would just, I would say as somebody from, uh, from Ohio State who was an intern at CNN is now over at Bloomberg at Kayla Green, who came in to, to CNN as an intern and just, I mean, knocked it out of the park and was so good and understood. And it wasn't like she was breaking huge scoops, you know, the, the uh, Pentagon papers or anything like that. But she was just rock solid. Um, and that's the stuff that, you know, she'll work in the industry as long as she wants and will probably be my boss one day. Uh, and it's because she can report and, you know, she could write too, but I'm saying like she could report. And that was, that's the first thing our boss has noticed. And I know she's over at Bloomberg now. And I know, you know, when she was going through the interview process over there, her clip showed it. Um, she could report. That's great. You know, you mentioned, and this is much earlier in our conversation about your unpaid internship. And it, it brought up a question here about paid versus unpaid internships. And, and you know, journalism has been right, right with uh, unpaid internships. What's your feeling on that now? You know, now that you've been on the other side of it, you've experienced one, but now you know you're in a place where other people want to come in and turn. Is this something that our students still face as a reality, or are there is, is it a changing marketplace for them? Um, I look. Admittedly, I'm not totally sure what the financial aspects are uh, across the board. I can tell you, you know, I paid for my I paid my way in Lima via my loan money uh, for graduate school. I just luckily had enough left over and you know an apartment in downtown lima wasn't you know immensely expensive at least compared to where i was living in boston um it's a huge there is a reality right now and i think we are all recognizing it every single day and i recognize it more and more because of my colleagues who have had great very candid discussions with me in terms about equity in the industry and it turns about in terms of representation you know i look around you know i take great pride in the fact i'm a public school kid uh, that I went to Ohio State, I didn't go to Princeton, I didn't go to Harvard, you know, so many of my colleagues are Ivy League kids, uh, kids, Ivy League folks, um, and it's, it's awesome, like, I, I wish I was that smart, and I wish I could have gotten into those schools, uh, you know, maybe if they had better baseball programs, um, but, uh, but, you know, that is very much, I think, on the national level, kind of the pedigree of a lot of folks, or did you go to Medill, um, or, or, or places like that, you know, Medill's not cheap, um, Boston University is not cheap. Ohio State's not cheap anymore. Um, and, uh, and so I, I think it is immensely imperative on our industry to figure out ways to finance internships. I, I, don't, I don't even think it should be a question anymore. And I look, I get it. The folks, you know, I figured out a way to make it work. You know, I, I, I from my bootstraps, figured out a way 30 years ago. Okay, it's different now. And also the industry is different now. Like my guess is the people who are saying that are generally white men. Um, and so, you know, like, and it's, I'm not trying to get into like a deep racial discussion here. I just think that there's a reality right now. You have to create as, as leaders in our industry, and I'm, I am not one of them. I'm not a decision maker, uh, but you have to create the environment and you have to create the space uh, for people to be able to come in and succeed. And I will tell you that our newsroom is better every single day, particularly given some of the discussions that we've been having as a nation over the course of the last year, because we have better representation in our newsroom. And we're still not there. And I think CNN would be the first ones to tell you, but I know we've made a concerted effort. Um, and I learn every single day uh, from people who don't look like me, who've had different experiences. And if you don't think our news coverage isn't, doesn't benefit from those voices or benefit from those experiences, like I, I don't know what to tell you. And I, I think that the internship process is the way in. You know, you can't get a job in this industry if you don't have clips. You get clips through an internship. Um, and if you can't afford an internship, then you have no way into this industry. Uh, there, there are ways, but like, it's just a lot harder. And we shouldn't be putting up barriers. Just like the government should be putting up barriers in terms of how we get information, we should not be putting up barriers in terms of the people who can access the ability to do this job because it's a great job and it's the coolest job in the world. And it shouldn't be exclusive to people who can afford a summer uh, wherever their location may be. Absolutely. Spencer, what are, what are we doing from your perspective to try to help our students do this? Well, we try to, we try to identify the best paid internships that we can find, but then um, unpaid internships are still a, a, a fact and it's still part of what's going on. And so if it's unpaid, then we evaluate how great of an opportunity it is, you know, and what are you gonna get out of this? And then, then we look for other ways to find support for the student you know, outside of outside of the the news organization, like grants or you know what kinds of other things exist that would still get you that opportunity that you would otherwise have to pay for out of your own pocket. Um, we've had we've had, we've, we've had some good opportunities that are unpaid, and that is a real barrier. 
Um, but it, I don't think it should uh, automatically veto somebody. And I think there are other opportunities we can find to try to help support students to, to make sure that they get those opportunities. It's a little well, bit pandemic, I think. Uh, I'm sure yeah. it is. Well, Phil, we, we don't have a ton of time, so I, I have to ask this question that came in earlier about um, about the board, about the CNN board, and you're one of the few people who's actually touched it. And uh, and, and, and I, can you kind of describe for us what, what goes on there and what that experience is like? And, um, you know, we, it's something that I think everyone who watches CNN looks forward to during the election cycle, but you have a more intimate knowledge of it. Um, yeah, first off, you know, John King, one, he's as smart as he seems on TV. He also has been an incredible mentor uh, to me. And, and look, it's, we, we live, we're in an interesting industry and there's not always people uh, who've come before you who are super eager to help, um, particularly if it's, it's such a specialized thing like that. Uh, and he has gone, he went out of his way once they started talking to me about doing it back in the midterms in 2018. He gave me every minute I asked for and more. Um, which was a, a huge part of it. In terms of, you know, the a couple of things I would say. One, there's a, a huge team behind it. You know, I have an earpiece in the whole time that I'm up there. Um, I have, we had, a, I had a, my own personal, just incredible producer who had visibility on everything that was going on when New Vote was coming in. You know, I could see some of it in real time, but she would also flag for me. Um, and so, you know, we owe a ton to to her and to to that our uh, our team. Um, and we also have our data viz folks who build the thing are just brilliant. Like the, the stuff they come up with, you know, it's so intuitive and yes, like it's not super easy when you get up there to figure out how it all works and all the different components, uh, but their ability to make it user-friendly to an English major who went to Ohio State uh, and hates technology is like just a, you know, if you need an example of their brilliance, um, that's the case. And, you know, I love Steve Kornacki. He's a friend um, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for him and I have a tremendous amount of respect for the MSNBC team, but like our, we call it the magic wall. It's not even close. It's light years ahead of, of our competitors. And that's because of those folks behind the scenes um, in terms of the you know, it's the coolest thing you could ever imagine. Um, you know, it's I, I, I liken it very much to, to my athletic career of, you know, we spent in the week leading up to the weeks leading up to the election, you know, we were in rehearsals every single morning, every single morning, we would have live data feeds, uh, basically gaming out any different scenario that could have happened on election night. And because of that, we were fully prepared for this election. We knew based on what was going on with mail-in voting, based on how the pandemic was playing out, that this could go days. Um, and so we were not surprised by anything. Um, you know, I was a little bit surprised by the fact that, you know, when I took over at 2 a.m. the morning, uh, you know, the day after the election, I guess, um, because uh, somebody needed to give John some coffee and, and a, a pillow, um, that, you know, I was there when, uh, when Michigan flipped, when Wisconsin flipped, you know, I was there when the mail-in vote in the Midwestern states uh, started to come in. And so to be there as that was happening in real time, but also the ability to explain why it was happening, how it was happening. Uh, it became such a, an important issue during that week of, you know, the, the best feedback we got as a team was you explained clearly why things were happening so people didn't think it was some grand conspiracy. And that was because of the preparation uh, that, that we, we had going into it. Um, but, you know, the, the, it, to be at the center of that, um, you know, for I would go 12 hours, then John would go 12 hours, I would go 12, we did it for five days. Uh, was just, it was unlike anything I'd ever been a part of. You know, people killed for 90 seconds every hour on TV and we were on 52 to 53 minutes per hour uh, sitting at the board. And, and the other thing, and I don't wanna ramble too long, I know we've only got a minute left. Um, it was clean, right? It was black and white. These are numbers. This is what's happening. You can't argue with this. And, and that was, I think what I liked more than anything else is it wasn't opinion, it wasn't panels, it wasn't people yelling at each other. It's here's the data and the data tells the story. And we did a ton of prep work to know exactly what was coming in, to know what we were talking about, what the counties were, what, what, what the states were, all that type of stuff. Uh, but you couldn't argue with it. And that was just nice um, to be able to just be up there and say, this is what's happening. Uh, and you can't argue with it. And that was, that was a good week. Uh, it was a good week for all of us. And it was, I was really proud to be a part of that team. Well, we're really proud to have you uh, as a Buckeye and, and proud that you could be here with us today. Um, this has been phenomenal and I, I can't thank you enough for your time and I uh, can't thank you enough, Spencer, for being here. Uh, please know that we are most grateful for you having been here with us. So look forward to additional terrific programming uh, coming out of Arts and Sciences. And I hope that uh, you'll keep reading The Lantern, keep watching Phil on CNN and everybody stay safe and we'll see you soon.